Let's take a look at our first experiment where we can measure uh, a result with an analysis of variance. And we'll start with a common experiment that you may have even done yourself, a website A-B test. An A-B test has visitors who come to a website and some are exposed to one version of the site and others are exposed to another version, hence the A and B term. We're gonna analyze this as an experiment uh, although obviously such an experiment doesn't take place in a lab as we might think of most experiments doing, but out there in the wild on the web. So here's the scenario we'll work with. First we'll talk about the design considerations of this experiment, uh, talk about some of the considerations when we're running the experiment, and then we'll move as we've done before to the R code and show how we would analyze this experiment statistically and report the result. So here's the scenario. Uh, let's say on a given day, uh, 500 uh, visitors to a website are treated as part of the experiment. Perhaps they're the first 500 who visit the website on that designated day. And let's say half of them are exposed to website A, and half of them are exposed to a variation of it, website B. Now that may not be the optimal way to run an A-B test. Perhaps it shouldn't just be on one day, for example. And perhaps it should be more than 500 people. Or perhaps it should be a certain number of people on a given day. All of those are good variations to consider, but for now we're going to keep it simple and just keep it to the scenario I described. We're interested in which website version causes people to view the most number of distinct pages. So maybe we think that a redesign of a website uh, say version B of this site, will uh, have people stay on the site longer and view more pages. So page, distinct pages viewed will be our measure. And uh, you could imagine in a, in a real world A-B test, we might also count time on site uh, and perhaps page loads or page views total uh, and other types of factors like that, maybe even clicks and things. So we're look, interested in the number of distinct pages that they view. So let's talk through some of the design considerations in this, in this experiment. First of all, let's think in terms of our variables. So I want to introduce the notion of independent variables and dependent variables. You maybe have heard these terms before. What are these? Let's make sure we're clear. Independent variables are the things we are manipulating. That's why they're independent. We're controlling them. Uh, so what's our independent variable in this simple website A-B test? It would be which version of the site they encounter, A or B. Dependent variables are the things that result from our manipulation, or sometimes called our treatment, which would be the site they're exposed to. The dependent variable is really the measure. And as I said before, we're interested in the number of distinct pages that are viewed. So we can call that pages. Now, let's talk in general terms for a moment. The idea behind an experiment is that some measure y is going to change and be a result of, and this is using the tilde like kind of R notation does, as we'll see more of, uh, some independent variables, let's say x, we just have one here, so we'll call it x, but if we had more than one, which we'll see later in the course, we may have x1 and x2 and x3 and so on. But y is, is related to x, um, and then we have to add plus epsilon, which is traditionally measurement error. The idea here in our case would be that the number of pages viewed, we think, might depend on the value that x takes. Is x website A or B plus measurement error? What's measurement error? Well, this is actually a very deep issue, but you can think of it as the random or error or noise that's in the measurements that, are, uh, that we're taking over, over people, over subjects, for this experiment. If I take 
you, you might say, well, why is there any measurement error? I mean, we know how many distinct pages they vi visit on the website. That's true. In that case, we know the measurement of the page count, uh, presumably without error, although there could be uh, perhaps some error in our code that's logging that or maybe some edge case that's not handled or something. But that's not just what measurement error is. Measurement error in this term is also considering the variation that naturally takes place when we measure things. So it doesn't have to be that we're logging it wrong. It could be that if I measured, uh, say, the same person on, on Tuesday and then measured them again on Wednesday, they may, in fact, have a different result. Uh, if I measure two different people, uh, they may have a different result due purely to the fact that they're different people, uh, not because the website really is, is, a, is causing that. Uh, these errors are taken to be uh, kind of random and usually normally distributed. And they are part of any experiment, any measurement. In fact, we, we don't know how much error may be in a measurement, how much variation may be natural variation. And that's why we need to have enough statistical power to draw the inferences over the population that we're after. Meaning, we want to know, is there a true difference between website A and B in this case, uh, in spite of the fact that we have some error in every single measurement because of the so-called natural variation uh, of, of any human behavior that we might be measuring. So that's what that term is. It's inescapable, and its exact value, of course, is unknowable. So, in our particular experimental case, we're looking at, as I said, the number of distinct pages being some relation to uh, the, whoops there, the site, the value of the site plus this error. Now, there's something else to be said about the design of this experiment as well. And that is that these variables each have types, and it's important to be aware of variable types. We saw in the previous section that we were recoding the subject variable as a factor, which is R's term for a categorical or nominal variable type. We also know that there are numeric variable types, also sometimes called continuous or scalar. And there's even a third type called ordinal or ordered, which are variables that are in a sequence uh, that, that has an order, like a Likert scale, like a 1 to 7 scale or a 1 to 5 scale, uh, or uh, short, medium, tall, taller, tallest. Things like that that have an order to them uh, are called ordinal. So there's these different variable types, and they affect the kind of analyses that we can do and the results that come. So let's take a look at variable types here. What's the variable type for this pages? Well, it is numeric, or numerical, or scalar, or continuous, all synonyms. I'll grab this color here, and we'll make a note of that. And in normal numeric, uh, in, in our customary analysis of variance situation, we'll see some analyses where this is not the case, but most will see that our y value will be numeric. It's a numeric outcome based on certain inputs. Well, what are those inputs types? What is the type of x here? It's site that can take on two values, a or b. That is called a categorical variable type or nominal type. So that would be in our equation here, categorical. So we have a function that we're looking at here, which is the number of pages, a numeric outcome, is, could be the, the result of differences in a categorical input or independent variable. OK, so those are variable types. And we'll see that throughout some of our analyses. Now, there are other terms that are relevant here that we'll use more commonly. We won't say independent variables probably much beyond this moment. We'll say factors, because Certain experiments we look at in the future will have multiple factors, and they'll be called factorial designs. That'll be later in the class. So independent variables can also be called, we'll use our other color here, also be called factors. And factors can take on values, just like site has, in this case, two values. Those values are called levels of the factor. So we have levels A and B 
for the site factor. Now, there's one last consideration to, to take into account, and that is that these factors can also be between subjects or within subjects. Well, what does that mean? Let me write those down. Between subjects, I'll abbreviate here, between subjects or within subjects. A between subjects factor is one for which only uh, each subject experiences only one value or level of that factor. So in our case, each subject would experience either website A or website B, but not both. A within subjects factor is one for which a participant experiences more than one level of the factor. In this case, it would be both website A and B. In a website A-B test, when a visitor comes to a site, they're usually issued into one or the other variations of the website and not both. And then a piece of local storage or a cookie or something similar is put on the machine to kind of remember which, uh, which site they were exposed to. So each time they go to the, the site, they get the same one. So that's what a between subjects and within subjects um, factor is. And when we have multiple factors, we can have uh, some of them be between subjects and some be within. To be a within subject factor, you only need to be exposed to more than one level of the factor. So if we had A, B, C, and D, uh, say, s versions of the site, if a, if a participant was exposed to A and B, but maybe not C and D, it would still be a within subjects factor. It would be a partial within subjects factor at that point. So these are some of the design considerations for this website A-B test. What are some things to keep in mind when we run such a test? This is by no means comprehensive list of considerations, but it's a few things we'd want to think about. One question is, do we measure each visitor only once? Remember, we're measuring how many distinct pages they view. What if they come back in the same day? Or what if they come back uh, in a time when they're still within that group of 500 that we said we wanted? For that matter, how many visitors do we want? Why 500? Should we want more or fewer? That kind of depends, again, on how big is, a, is, is the difference in pages visited uh, between these, these website A and B versions. If the differences are great, we don't need so many uh, subjects. If the differences are smaller, we may need more to tell a difference. Is the split 50-50? Do half the subjects get A and half get B? You can run website A-B tests, of course, with any arbitrary split, say 90-10 or 80-20. Um, uh, in our case, for this data, we'll more or less do 50-50, but it may depend on uh, uh, an algorithm that assigns people the conditions uh, in a way that could get slightly unbalanced. Uh, and so that's a consideration as well. Is the design a balanced design or an unbalanced design? Balanced designs have the same number of data points in every condition. Unbalanced designs uh, do not. So those are some of the things to think about. For our purposes in this particular uh, study, we will have near a 50-50 split, but it comes out, as we'll see, not quite exactly 50-50, and that's okay. Uh, and uh, we have a total of 500 visitors, uh, and, uh, and we do measure each visitor only once. So we have one measure per visitor, the number of distinct pages they viewed, uh, either in website A or website B. Let's go now to look at the uh, R code and see how we would do the analysis for this kind of experiment.